Thanks to David, because each one of the songs that we have sung in worship this morning has had echoes in the song of the psalm, Psalm 71. It was written by someone. We don't know who, we don't know their identity. Many psalms are attributed to David, uh, some to other individuals, as next Sunday we're going to look at Psalm 90, which was written by Moses. But some of the psalms, we have no idea who wrote them. Now, since we don't know who wrote the psalm, I'll just simply refer to the author throughout as the psalmist. Now, from the content of the psalm, we know three things about this psalmist. First, he's old. Twice he mentions that he's old and got gray hair. Second, throughout his life, he's known difficulty. He's known danger. Though he spares us the details because that's not his primary concern. Third, as he nears the end of his life, he's fearful. He's afraid. Not of dying, but of other things, as we shall soon see. In our exploration, we're going to seek to understand the content of his fears and his response to them as he wisely takes them to God, entering into a, a conversation with God, with whom he's had a relationship since his early childhood. Now, why did I select Psalm 71? I suspect I've read this psalm dozens of times, and it never really made much of an impression on me until I reached the age of 65 or somewhere in that neighborhood. And I began to accept the fact that I was becoming like that psalmist, a senior citizen. And I began to identify with some of his, some of his feelings and some of his thoughts. And I found that some of his prayers were becoming my prayers. I might have called Psalm 71 a psalm for people in their senior years, because it is that, but I think I'll stick to the original title because the psalm truly is for everyone. For every one of us, unless our lives are somehow cut short, we'll grow old and likely share some of the difficulties and feelings of the psalmist. And every one of us is acquainted with someone who is certifiably old and may share some of the psalmist's concerns. Now, what is obvious from experiences through the ages is that growing old has its own set of difficulties. It's, it's quite challenging and sometimes painful. But it also has its own set of blessings, which may at times be a little more difficult for us to see. So let's go through Psalm 71 together, focusing on what the psalmist says to God and what he says about himself and the fears that he confronts as he grows older. He wastes no time in taking his concerns and fears to God. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 71. It's on page 444 in your, your pew Bible, if you'd like to use that. Or you can follow on the screen. He goes straight to God with his fears and his needs. O oh Lord, I have come to you for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. Save me and rescue me, for you do what is right. Turn your ear to listen to me and set me free. Be my rock of safety where I can always hide. Give the order to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. My God, rescue me from the power of the wicked, from the clutches of cruel oppressors. I'd like us first to focus on the words that describe God in, in these verses. I'll read them to you. You do what is right. God is righteous. Be my rock of safety. God is a fortress, a fortress, a refuge for safety. And God is my rock and my fortress. Now, we know that he could have said much more about God, but here his focus on God is shaped by his current need. He needs help. So he comes to God for that help because God is righteous. God is a place of safety. And God is a deliverance from the enemies. Security from those in danger. Now, what is he asking God to do? He's asking God for protection. Don't let me be disgraced. He wants to be free from disgrace. Uh, he wants God to give the order to save him. He wants God to be his rock and his fortress. He wants God to rescue him. He prays for protection from disgrace, for rescue, for salvation, for safety. 
for security. What Old Testament stories might the psalmist have had in the back of his mind as as he composed this poem, as he wrote this song? One might have the cave, one might have been the cave of Adullam, where David hid when Saul was trying to kill him. It's referred to as a fortress in that story in 1 Samuel 22. He may have been thinking of that, that fortress where David went for safety. Or it may have been that he was thinking about the six cities of refuge that were established by Joshua. You can read about that in Joshua chapter 20. A person who had killed someone by accident could flee to one of those cities of refuge and be kept in safety from the avenging family of the deceased who would come and claim his life as forfeit. That's maybe what it was. Because he talks about being fearful of being caught in shame. It appears that he had some enemies who wanted to see him disgraced or shamed. Maybe it's a fact that he, in spite of his good intentions, in spite of his godly character, had done something wrong. Sometimes we do sin unintentionally without even realizing at the time. Guilty of some action that would have brought him shame in his older years. And this is why he needs God to be his place of refuge. He continues his prayer, verse 5. O Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from childhood. Yes, you have been with me from birth. From my mother's womb, you have cared for me. No wonder I am always praising you. My life is an an example to many because you have been my strength and protection. That is why I can never stop praising you. I declare your glory all day long. What we see here is a man who has trusted God since his early childhood and has experienced God's faithful care. He's now encouraging himself to keep trusting God and to proclaim God's goodness praising him at every opportunity. We sang a hymn just prior to this sermon written by Joseph Addison. Uh, Joseph Addison was born, I think, around 16... born in 1672. He was trained as a lawyer. He served as a civil servant in some very significant positions, the most important being the chief secretary for Ireland. Uh, It seems to be a requirement for lawyers in those days that you had to wear wigs. So that's not his normal hair in that that photograph. He wrote many hymns, and he published them not in hymnals, but in newspapers. That's the sort of thing they did in those days. They would look to the newspaper to find the newest hymn. The first two verses that we sang parallel the thoughts of the psalmist, who spoke of God's care from infancy and twice declared his intention to praise God. When all thy mercies, O my God, my rising soul surveys, transported with a view, I'm lost in wonder, love, and praise. Unnumbered comforts to my soul, thy tender care bestowed, before my infant heart conceived, from whom those blessings flowed. He's known the love and care of God since he was a tiny infant before he could even articulate or know what it was. However, alongside the psalmist's trust and praise is this fear that we've noticed. They don't cancel each other out. This is important to note. But they exist together. Trust and fear exist together in attention. I think it's attention that we know well in our own lives. But what does he fear? Well, verse 9, I'd like to go to. And now in my old age, don't set me aside. Don't abandon me when my strength is failing. In his latter years, he fears being set aside. He fears being abandoned. He acknowledges that his strength is failing, but he doesn't want to be useless left on a shelf with nothing to do. 
For many of us in our latter years, maybe this feeling of being set aside, of being abandoned and useless is painful. And it's good to read this in this psalm and say, well, I'm not the first one to feel like this. Now you're getting some understanding of why I chose this psalm. Now, he had some enemies who were fueling this idea of him being useless. Verse 10, for my enemies are whispering against me. They are plotting together to kill me. I think they were plotting literally to kill him necessarily. What were they killing? His reputation. His standing. They say, God has abandoned him. Let us go and get him, for no one will help him now. Oh, God, don't stay away. My God, please hurry to help me. Bring disgrace and destruction on my accusers. Humiliate and shame those who want to harm me. Don't those words sound a little bit harsh? Coming from a godly psalmist? Humiliate my enemies? Maybe they are. Maybe that's one of the reasons we're drawn to the Psalms. They're honest. He wants his enemies to experience the shame that they want him to experience. It's kind of a level that most of us operate at, isn't it? But there might be a key that helps us unlock this little puzzle in his thoughts. Maybe the psalmist is not vindictive, he doesn't want revenge. He doesn't necessarily want his enemies to suffer. What he really wants is to be vindicated, to be acknowledged as significant, as important, as useful. He doesn't take the fight to his enemies. He looks to God and he trusts in God to do this for him, to be his vindication. That's ultimately the wisest choice that any person could make. Let's keep going. We feel the the growing faith of the psalmist as he continues this conversation with God in verse 14. But I will keep on hoping for your help. I will praise you more and more. I will tell everyone about your righteousness. All day long I will proclaim your saving power. Though I am not skilled with words, I will praise your mighty deeds, O sovereign Lord. I will tell everyone that you alone are just. O God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood, and I constantly tell others about the wonderful things you do. Now that I am old and gray, do not abandon me, O God. Let me proclaim your power to this new generation, your mighty miracles to all who come after me. A couple of things we need to note. The word but... In verse 14, it marks a decisive shift in the psalmist's thinking. He's determined not to focus on his failing strength, but rather, and not even to focus on his enemies, but rather to focus on God. He's going to keep his eyes on God. He makes that choice in the middle of his distress. I'm not going to focus on my my weakness. I'm not going to focus on my enemies. I will focus my eyes on God. I will place my hope and confidence in God. I will praise God and tell everyone about his saving power, he says. Now, our version reads, though I am not skilled with words, but fortunately, it puts a footnote there. You'll see it in your Bible at the bottom of the page. The footnote reads that a better or different translation, a different translation would be, though I cannot count them. I cannot count it. He knows that the righteousness of God and his saving power cannot be counted. It would be like trying to count the stars in the heavens. It would be trying to like, to like to count all the sands on all the seashores of the world. You just cannot count the greatness of God's righteousness and his, and his saving power. So he says, I, I, I talk about it, but I can't even begin to understand all of it or enumerate or list all of it, but I still talk about it. And I tell people what God has done. This is his resolve. 
to be useful in spite of his age by proclaiming God's power to a new generation, by telling others what God has done for them, by talking about God's miracles. Now, what exactly will the psalmist tell this new generation? Well, verse 19. We sang it this morning. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the highest heavens. You have done such wonderful things. Who can compare with you, O God? You have allowed me to suffer much hardship. But you will restore me to life again and lift me up from the depths of the earth. You will restore me to even greater honor and comfort once again. He's simply going to tell the younger generation what he himself has experienced. And he will not just tell them the good parts, the Sunday school parts. Look at verse 20. You have allowed me to suffer much hardship. Another version, which is a a little more detailed, says, You have shown me many troubles, and distresses. You who have shown me many troubles and distresses will revive me again and bring me up again from the depths of the earth. Troubles and distresses, dangers and disasters, so extreme in his life that they felt like death to the psalmist. And yet God was faithful and raised him up again, brought him up from the depths of the earth, now, I, I mentioned that the hymn by Addison was a commentary on this psalm. I don't, we have no idea that he wrote it intentionally, but it's such a parallel to this psalm that it wouldn't be surprising if he didn't write this hymn after reading the psalm. Because he talks of this dangers and distresses. He says in a verse that we sang, When worn with sickness, oft hast thou with health renewed my face. And when in sins and sorrows sunk, Revived my soul with grace. Some of the disasters and distresses and troubles that he talks about were caused by his own sins, quite likely. Because that's true in our lives, isn't it? We run into trouble because of our own fault, our own propensity to sin. And yet God has not abandoned him. God revives him. When in sins and sorrow sunk, who of us can't identify with that? Who of us hasn't been in that place of shame? How much better in remembering them to remember how God has revived our soul and given us new strength. This has been the experience of the psalmist, and he will tell his story, not out of nostalgia or reminiscence, but because for the psalmist, It's not his story. It's God's story. He's going to tell others about God using his own story as the vehicle. Yes, he's old, and yes, his strength is failing, but he's not going to quit. He will not be useless. He will do all he can do to encourage the next generation to trust God. Verse 17, O God, you have taught me from my earliest childhood And I constantly tell others about the wonderful things that you do. For those of us who are older, we have the blessing of experience. We can look back and we can see God's goodness, God's mercy, God's faithfulness, God's forgiveness. And we can look back at the difficult and dangerous times, even the times that we ran into difficulty because of our own sin. And we can see that God was our protector, our keeper, our helper, our refuge. And we can respond in praise and tell others that good news. In other words, we have meaningful work to do until we can no longer speak, either by reason of illness or death. One person created an image for this psalm and has labeled this psalm serving God to death. Serving God until death ends the work. God has not abandoned us. Abandoned us. He has not forgotten us. We have work to do. Let us seek to do it well as God enables us. 
Well, what about those of you who don't yet collect pension from the government or the pension plans that you worked at through work? But what can you take away from this psalm? Some of you were smiling and saying, yeah, glad you got around to that. Thank you. Permit me to offer four suggestions. Write them down on something. Otherwise, if you're like me, which you surely are, you'll forget them before you get home. Especially if you got to lunch somewhere, for sure you'll forget them before you get home. Number one, learn now to see and appreciate God's righteous presence in your life. Learn now, because we can be surrounded by God's presence and goodness and not even notice it. We'll blame the good things on ourselves or circumstance, happenstance. Learn to appreciate God's goodness in your life. Learn to see the marks of his activity in your life. Number two, determine to practice praising God no matter what your circumstances are. Six times the psalmist declares his determination to praise God. Verse 6, no wonder I am always praising you. Verse 8, that's why I can never stop praising you. Verse 14, I will praise you more and more. Verse 16, I will praise your mighty deeds. Verse 22, then I will praise you. Verse 23, I will shout for joy and sing your praises. Practice praising God. Number 3. Make some personal preparations for growing old. I'm not talking about financial planning. Uh, That's a good thing, by the way, and, and I hope you're all doing that. Rather, ask yourself a couple of key questions, and when you have those questions in mind, build some strategies around those questions. I'm going to give you two. What sort of person do you want to be when you're old? When you're 30 is a good time to figure that out. And start creating strategies to become that kind of person. What kind of person don't you want to be when you're old? Come up with some strategies and start praying about those. What sort of life would you wish to look back on when you're old? What accomplishments would you like to have? What satisfactions would you like to know? They're not going to happen by accident, you know. You need to work at it and pray about it. Number four, get acquainted with some older person. And get to know that person. Learn what can be learned from that person. And pray for that person. Because getting old is not for the faint of heart. I I went to visit two old friends. They're both in their 90s. uh, A couple of weeks ago. Both in a... Assisted, I don't know what you call it, one of those fancy places where seniors live and they serve you meals and you got your own apartment. There's a name for that. I don't remember what it is. So they live in a very nice place. Hmm? Beg your pardon? Assisted living? Excellent. Sounds like a good plan to me. So they're living in this, in this lovely place, but life is not easy. One dear friend has is, is, is always been one of the brightest persons I've known and we used to argue theology with great warmth and vigor but he can't remember words anymore as he tries to converse he can't find the words he wants and the other who has been strong all his life can hardly get up and down out of his chair it's not easy to be old but after being with him for three hours I came away blessed because they still had much to share with me and many ways to bless me. But they need my prayers. Now it's time to finish the psalm, the last two verses as we close. Then I will praise you with music on the harp, because you are faithful to your promises. O oh my God, I will sing praises to you with a lyre, O Holy One of Israel. I will shout for joy and sing your praises, for you have ransomed me. I will tell about your righteous deeds all day long, for everyone who tried to hurt me has been shamed and humiliated. This is the declaration that we made together as we sang Addison's hymn. Through every period of my life, thy goodness I'll pursue, and after death in distant worlds, the glorious theme renew. Through all eternity to thee, a joyful song I'll raise. 
For, oh, eternity's too short to utter all thy praise. Those are some remarkable words that we sang, aren't they? That is a wonderful aspiration for us to have for this life and the life to come. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this psalm by someone who we don't know their name, but someone old who had learned your faithfulness and your goodness and was determined to share that with the next generation. Let us, each one of us this morning, take from this psalm the things that you would want us to learn and that you would want us to know and renew in each of us a determination to trust you and to praise you. We ask it, Lord, in your name. Amen.